You'll notice that I don't have my lately customary screen about why I want to come back to services tonight. <coughs> and because I'm not urging you to come back to services tonight, <coughs> I'm urging you to stay for our potluck, our time of fellowship. Certainly is a good thing for us to be able to be together. There was a Chinese farmer. He had a horse that ran away, and his neighbors expressed sympathy about his bad news. His response was, good news, bad news, who can say? It wasn't very long after that that his horse returned and brought a second horse with him. And his neighbors congratulated him about his good news. And he said, good news, bad news, who can say? The farmer gave the new horse to his son who was thrown off of the new horse and broke his leg. And the neighbors said such bad news. He said, good news, bad news, who can say? Days later, the emperor's soldiers came around, rounding up all of the able-bodied young men for war. And the farmer's injured son was spared. And the neighbors said such good news. And you know what the farmer said. Good news, bad news, who can say? Truth is truth. Sometimes when we talk about some element of truth, it's hard to tell if that element of truth is good news or bad news. Here's the truth that we want to talk about today. It is the idea of free will. Man has free will. Man can make decisions. He can determine his direction. He can decide on his actions. Is this good news or bad news? Who can say? We're going to look first, as we go through this, at the bad news. And then we're going to look at the good news. And this comes, of course, from Ezekiel 18. You may want to have your Bibles open to that passage. First, bad news. Ezekiel 18, 26 says, When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. There certainly is a bad news side, a bad news element to this idea of free will. People often decide to do evil. Just look around. I don't mean here. I mean in general. People often decide to do evil. This particular lesson is called changing sides. It struck me a few months ago as I was reading various parts of the Old Testament how a, a righteous man could change sides and become an unrighteous man. Or an unrighteous man could change sides and become a righteous man. We need to understand this and how free will relates to this the fact is that all Christian people can fall from grace. <clears throat> if you're taking notes, that first verse up there should be 1 Corinthians 10, 12, not 1. That's a gremlin did that. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Let him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed, lest he fall. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, the Hebrew writer said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. There is the danger of changing sides. They couldn't depart from the living God unless they were on his side, but they had the ability to depart from the living 
God. Hebrews 3 and verse 13, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you, remember he's writing to Christian people, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should, came to, should seem to come short of it. And then Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. In this passage, that rest is heaven. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. Ye, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before. Again, he's writing to Christian people. Seeing you know these things before, lest beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Christians can fall from grace. It is possible for a righteous man, sadly, to change sides and find himself working for the cause of unrighteousness. Apostasy is a real and present danger. In fact, it's easier to fall than it is to remain faithful. If you want to remain faithful, you have to study God's Word. You have to learn God's will. You have to put it into practice. You don't have to study to fall. In fact, if you don't study, you will fall. You don't have to struggle with yourself. You don't have to discipline yourself to fall. But you do if you want to remain righteous. If you want to remain faithful, you have to resist Satan. If you don't resist, if you simply go with the flow, if you follow his temptations and his lures and the persecutions he sends your way to intimidate you, the lies that he tells, you have fallen. Here's a fact. You don't have to do anything to fall. That's how easy it is to fall. You can fall just by doing nothing. In fact, doing nothing is falling. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We already mentioned Hebrews chapter 4 about laboring to enter into that rest. If we do nothing, we will fall. It is hard to remain faithful. It takes study. It takes labor. It takes self-control. Sadly, there is a common doctrine in the religious world today that denies the possibility of a Christian falling, falling from grace. This is called the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Some would prefer the term the security of the saints. Just to illustrate it, let me give you a couple of quotes from denominational preachers. Sam Morris, a denominational preacher, a Calvinist, said, We take the position that a Christian's sins do not condemn his soul. The way a Christian lives, now this is a quote, remember, I'm not advocating this, I'm rebuking this. I'm exposing this. He says, the way a Christian lives, what he says, his character, his conduct, or his attitude toward other people has nothing whatever to do with the salvation of his soul. All the prayers a man can pray, all the Bibles he may read, all the churches he may belong to, all the services he may attend, all the sermons he may practice, and all the debts he may pay, all the ordinances he may observe, all the laws he may keep, and all the benevolent acts he may perform will not make his soul one bit safer. Listen as the quote goes on. And all the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. Now it is true that we can't earn our way into heaven and all of the sermons we listen to or preach and all of the things, we, they're not, we're not earning our way into heaven. I don't mean to give that indication at all. 
But there are things that we have to do that God expects of us. And certainly, if we find ourselves laboring, not in the cause of Christ, but in the labor of, uh, in the, the cause of unrighteousness, it does put our soul in greater danger. A man named Bill Foster, a denominational preacher in Louisville, Kentucky, he said it this way. He said, if I killed my wife and mother and debauched a thousand women, I couldn't go to hell. In fact, I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. That's the doctrine of the security of the saints, folks. That's the idea of once saved, always saved. We know that this is clearly a false doctrine. And we have for as long as I've been around, and certainly before that, stood against this false doctrine in our teaching. Let me challenge you with this idea. There are some false doctrines that we claim not to believe, but we still practice. This may be one of them. Maybe. I know some Christians who seem to try to live this doctrine of once saved, always saved. Well, I was baptized. I'm a member of the church. I'm okay. They don't study to gain more knowledge. They don't struggle to overcome temptation and sin. They don't assemble with the saints to exhort and be exhorted. And they seem to feel secure about their salvation, even though they don't live lives that are different from the world. Once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. Taught or practiced. The fact is, it is possible for a righteous man to change sides. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Paul wrote, wrote to those people in Galatia and he told them that if they were trying to keep the law of Moses in order to be justified, they had fallen from grace. Think about what that means. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. If we fall from grace, we're not saved anymore. We can't possibly be saved any longer. If we fall from grace. So there is no doubt a bad news side to this idea of free will. <clears throat> but there's a good news side. And that's really what this lesson is trying to emphasize today. It is possible for a sinner to change sides. Ezekiel 18 and verse 27 that was read for us. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. That's not discounting the grace of God. It's a condition of being saved. That we have to live righteous lives. In Ezekiel 18 and verse 31, Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? It's possible to change sides. It's possible to have a new heart. It's possible to have a new spirit. This is not just good news. This is life-changing news. This is life-giving news. This is news that can make a difference, that can make truly an eternal difference. If you are a sinner... You don't have to live like a sinner. You don't have to stay a sinner. Regardless of your parents, your past, your DNA, your environment, there is no script that forces you to remain a sinner. If you're a child of Satan, I think you've been studying about this in your Bible class, you can leave Satan's family and be adopted into God's family. It's possible to change sides. Now, this series of lessons is called Patience and Comfort from Romans 15, 4. The things written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 
And so I want to bring out a, an Old Testament character that switched sides from being evil to being good. One that should give us a measure of patience and comfort and therefore hope. <clears throat> Her name was Rahab. She is introduced to us in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. We need to understand first that her environment was an evil one. She was part of a heathen nation. She was part of a group of nations that was so evil, God was preparing to destroy them, man, woman, and child. That's how evil they were. In Genesis 15 and verse 16, Abraham, who had been promised that land where these nations lived, he said, I'm not going to give it to you right now, God did. He said, but in the fourth generation. And the reason, he said, Genesis 15, 16, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, Speak not thou in thine heart after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness, nor for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Leviticus 18, after he lists a, a number of sins that he calls abominations, in verse 26, he says, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation or any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. Rahab grew up in that area where all these abominations were being. Not only that, the city in which she lived was slated for complete destruction, keeping nothing alive. Absolutely nothing. So we have Rahab, who was raised in a sinful, evil environment. Secondly, she had become an evil person. Her lifestyle was evil. She is introduced to us in Joshua 2 and verse 1 as a harlot, a prostitute. It would have been a natural and easy thing for the spies to go to her house because it wasn't unusual to see men coming in and out of that house. May have also helped that her house was on the wall. I'm not sure if that had something to do with it, but uh, <clears throat> Adam Clark, in his commentary on this, he makes an argument that Rahab was not really an evil person. She was an innkeeper. And he goes into the original language and some other languages and and used some historical things to try to prove his point that she was just an innkeeper. He sounds very scholarly in that commentary. He actually sounds like he's trying to be kind and, and rehabilitate her name. But he forgets one of the main ideas of Bible interpretation. Commentators often do this. Beware, okay? He forgets that we're supposed to allow the Bible to interpret the Bible for us. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. James 2 and verse 25, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. I don't believe there's any real doubt about the Hebrew word that's translated harlot or prostitute. Uh, in Joshua. But even if there was, the New Testament clears up any doubt about it. There's no doubt about this Greek word, what it means, a female prostitute. So God has given his divine commentary 
on the life of this woman. It was the Holy Spirit that labeled Rahab as a prostitute. And I believe that God's commentary ought to weigh more with us than Adam Clark's. So we have a sinful woman living in a sinful city in an evil nation among other evil nations. But Rahab's name occurs another time in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. We're not told all of the rest of the story of Rahab. We know she was saved because she protected the spies. But we're not told all of the story. We learn from the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 that she married into the Israelite nation. She married a man named Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N. <clears throat> and she and Salmon had a son named Boaz. That name sound familiar to you? Who eventually married the Moabite woman named Ruth. And Rahab, the sinful heathen woman, became the great, great grandmother of King David. And the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. How? You see, she was evil. She grew up in an evil environment, but she didn't stay evil. She changed sides. She had heard about the God of Israel. Joshua 2, 10 and 11. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Now this was 40 years ago that she's, that she's referring to here. I don't know if she, if she was even alive at the time, but she'd heard about it as parting of the Red Sea. And what ye did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Listen to this. For the Lord, that word is all in caps in the King James Version, signifying that's referring to Jehovah. The Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. She became a believer in Jehovah, the God of Israel. And this is what is said about her in Hebrews 11 and verse 31, that Rahab perished not with them that believed not. Why? Because she believed. She changed sides. She was saved from destruction by her faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 31. She was justified by her works when her faith led her to preserve the spies, James 2 and verse 25. She did not stay an evil person. She changed sides. Now, somebody's going to ask. We've got to go through this quickly. I, I am watching the new clock that's up back there. But uh, <clears throat> somebody's going to ask, well, what about the lies she told? Because she told actually more than one. Protecting these spies. The men came looking for them. And said, oh, they, they're gone. They left. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, they, they went over the brook there. Maybe you can go find them. All the time they were up on the roof of her house, hidden. And so she was lying. Does this mean that lying is okay? Or that it's okay depending on the situation? Situational lying for a good cause, has been taught to our society, to our children, for many, many, many years. I'm not trying to knock anyone off of a pedestal, but the character Andy Griffith was one of the worst liars on television. In virtually every episode, he lied for some good reason. Or what they thought was a good reason. Is this the lesson that we're supposed to learn from Rahab? Absolutely not. She is never commended for her lie, but for the aid that she gave to the spies. Remember, she's in the process of moving from being a heathen to being a believer. 
Remember that she didn't have the law of Moses to guide her about what was right and wrong. She does what she can in this situation. The situation does not make her lie any less a sin. The outcome of the situation, the protection of the spies, doesn't make her lie any less a sin. Her story should not encourage us to lie. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. If there is no situation in which God can lie, how could we dream up a situation that makes it all right for us to lie? Besides that, Revelation 21 and verse 8 is very plain, that all liars have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, does that mean Rahab is going to go to that lake of fire? No, I don't believe it. Because she changed sides. And she could be forgiven for that lie. Not because of the situation, but because she turned to Jehovah God. Instead of focusing on her lie, let's focus on her courage. Let's focus on her faith. Let's focus on her works and risking her own safety to hide these two spies. And even more important, let's focus on the glory of this story. A heathen prostitute married into God's chosen nation and became the great, 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 great grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. She stands for us an example of faith and works and how necessary they are in pleasing God. If we don't get anything else from this, people can change. They can turn from their evil and be forgiven. People can learn God's will instead of say, staying ignorant. Evil people can learn to obey God's will. Here's the conclusion of this lesson. There is no sinner in this room that cannot be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are not too sinful. And you do not have to stay in sin or continue in a sinful lifestyle. Remember the Chinese farmer. Good news? Bad news? Who can say? You can say. You're the one that determines whether your free will is a good thing or a bad thing. You're the one that decides to use this for the glory of God or to use this in the service of Satan. One more. Go through these, as I say, quickly. It's up to us. We can, James 4 and verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from us. We can put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. We can hide the word in our hearts that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 and verse 11. We can discern between good and evil through God's word. Hebrews 5 and verse 14. We can choose to do evil, to do good and not evil. Yes, we can choose to do evil. But that's, that's the bad news. The good news is we can choose to do good and not evil. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10 talks about the one who would love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Verse 11 says, let him eschew evil. Draw back from it, shun it, turn away from it. Let him eschew evil and do good. We have the choice. We are not scripted. It is not something that God decides for us. It is not something that Satan decides for us. It is something that we determine about ourselves. Good news, bad news, it's up to us. Are you a Christian today? Have you been baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins? First, having believed, John 8 and verse 24, repented of your sin, Acts 2 and verse 38, confessed your faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Have you been baptized into Jesus? Are you walking in the light? Are you living as you ought to? Are you struggling to stay in the grace of God. Because if we don't struggle, we will fall. The invitation song is, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can decide that today. Won't you come as we stand and sing?